Hi, my name is Methat El Masri. Today I'm going to show you an ASP.NET MVC application that interacts with a JSON endpoint. And we will be doing all the CRUD operations against that API. The date is April 20, 2020, and we are in the age of the coronavirus. So let's get started. I'll be using the following API. This API represents students. So the columns that we have here are student ID, first name, last name, school, and all of them happen to be strings. When you're dealing with APIs, especially RESTful APIs, the POST method is used to insert data, the PUT method is used to update data, the GET method is used to retrieve data, and the DELETE method is used, obviously, to delete data. Today, I'm going to develop my application using the VS Code, but you can use any other editor if you want, or you can even use Visual Studio 2019. The version of .NET that I have is as follows. Let me type in .NET minus minus version, and I have 3.1.200. So now let me create a simple ASP.NET MVC application using this command. .NET new MVC minus O consume students API. Now the minus O switch is simply going to create a new directory under the current directory and it will generate for me the MVC template. Let me go into that directory now. And inside of this directory, I need a package called Newtonsoft. So let me add that package first. And the Newtonsoft JSON package is very useful when you're dealing with JSON object. There goes, it's installing it. Now I'll open my application in code. And I do that by simply typing code dot on Windows. By the way, this application, you can do it equally on a Mac. It doesn't really matter. Inside of the models folder, I'm going to create a new class representing the student object. So I'm going to call it student. The code for my student class is going to look like this. Let me resolve these namespaces here. Now the properties here, they represent the column names in the API. Let's have a look at the API again. If you look at the APIs here, my student ID represents this column, first name represents that column, last name and school represents the remaining columns. I have set the display name here for the student ID to be simply uppercase I and uppercase D. This is so that in my applications, wherever this information is being displayed, it displays as big I and big D, and that's a little bit more user-friendly. And I do the same for first name, last name, and school. The display names here would be first name with a space in between, last name, and school. All of the properties are required. Now I've set the first property, which is student ID, as key. And this essentially sets it to be the primary key. So let's close this because we're done with it. We will be using the iHttp client factory class to make HTTP requests to the API. Therefore, we need to add a singleton object into our application. So we're going to add some code in the configure services method in the startup.cs file. So I'm opening the startup.cs file and in here in the configure services method, I'm going to add this line of code. And this essentially allows you to do dependency injection of the IHTP client factory in our controllers. Now let's create a student's controller that's going to do for us the CRUD operations. It's going to allow us to list our students, to add or insert a student, to edit a student, and to delete a student. So inside of my controllers folder, I'm going to create a new class here and I'll call it the students controller. 
Now, the first thing I want to do is to inherit from the controller class because this is a controller. And I want to declare an instance variable that represents the IHTP client factory. So I'm going to put this in here. And next, I want to have a constructor so that I can use dependency injection to inject the IHTP client factory. And this comes by doing something like this. So here's my constructor and I pass an argument, which is the client factory object. And here I assign that object to the instance variable underscore client factory. Next, let me declare another instance variable that represents a collection of students. Let me resolve this. So I need to import the system collections generic. I need to import the namespace for the student class. Let me add an action method that retrieves for me the data. So typically that would be like an index action method and it would look something like this. Let me resolve these namespaces. So I'm going to add a constant here that represents the address of my base URL. And now let me fill the remaining code for my index action method. So this would be the remaining code. Let me resolve these namespaces. For URI, we need to import the system namespace. And for JSON serializer, we get a choice between system.text.json or newtonsoft.json. Let's choose system.text.json. And now pretty much all of these have been resolved. So let's look at the code. Here we're constructing an HTTP request message object and we're setting the method to be get. The endpoint is going to be the base URL plus API slash students. And we're going to accept JSON objects only. So using the client factory, we're going to create an HTTP client object. And with the HTTP client object, we're going to call the send async method and pass it the message. It returns a response. If the response is successful, we will get a true for is success status code, which means everything went well. Otherwise, we will just set the array to be empty. But if we're successful, we're going to read the stream and then deserialize the stream into a collection of student objects. So at this point, we should be getting students. And the students is what we have declared as an instance variable here. So our action method for reading the data seems to be okay. What is missing now is we must have a view for this thing. So let's go to the views folder. And in here, we need to create a new folder called students. And inside of students folder under views, we're going to create a new file and we'll call it index.cshtml. And this is essentially the view for that action method. And here is the code for that view. We're going to set the model to be a collection of student objects. The important part here is that this here is the title that represents the four columns of our model. And here we're going to iterate through the collection and display the student ID, the first name, the last name, the school. And here we have three buttons. As you can see, these are all bootstrap buttons. One is for edit, the next one is details, and the third one is delete. So at this point, we should be able to run our application and check whether it works. Now, it is customary to add a menu item in our layouts. So if you come here under shared, let's open layout.cshtml and around line 26, we can add another line item here so that we can click on it and it takes us to the index page. So let me add this code here. And this is yet another line item. It points to the students controller, as you can see here. 
and the index action method. And this is what we'll display in the menu. We're good to go now. Let's just do a quick build to make sure that we don't have any errors. It looks like we don't have any errors. So let's do a .NET watch run. And the watch is so that if there are any changes to the files, it will recompile. Let's run and see what happens. Now we can go to localhost 5001. Let's click on students and see what happens. So we have an error. And that is because the base URL that I've given you is not real. I'm going to switch off the video and put the real URL. I did not give you the real URL for security reasons. So now I updated that base URL and you can see that it recompiled here. Let's go back to our page and run it again. Click on students. It takes a bit of time because this is an API, but hopefully it will come back and there you go. We got the data that we're looking for. Of course, all of these buttons, they don't work yet. So we're going to go one by one and make them work. The first thing we're going to get to work is create new. Then we're probably going to do details, delete, and finally edit. Simply because details is much easier. Delete is also pretty easy. And edit is not that complicated, but it's not as easy as details and delete. So let's start with create new. Let's go back to our students controller. Now we need two action methods for creating data. We need one that displays the view and the other one that takes the data that's submitted and processes it. So the first one is very simple. It's going to return a view and it will look something like this. We need now to add the create view. So let's go to the views folder and in the views folder under students, we're going to add another view and we'll call it create dot c s h t m l the markup for create dot c s h t m l will look like this it's going to have a model that represents the student object and we've got a form here that posts to a create method on the controller there are input fields for the student id here an input field for the first name the last name, the school. Finally, there's the submit button that submits to the server. If we run this application now, we should see that it displays the view for creating data. Let's try. So if I click on create new, it actually complains that it doesn't find the view. And I know that if I restart this thing, maybe it would work again. Let's find out. You can see that the view for adding a student displays. But of course, if I click on create, the action method for posting the data is not there yet. So let's work on that next. So let's go to the students controller and underneath this create action method that responds to get, we're going to add another action method that responds to post, as you can see here. And it expects a student object with property student ID, first name, last name, and school. Here, we're going to serialize the object and load it into this string content object. Now, the string content object, we're going to set the header of content type application JSON. Just as we did in the index action method, we're going to instantiate an HTTP request message object, set the content to be this content, set the method to be post. Previously it was get, now it's post. And the endpoint is pretty much the same endpoint as our index. 
Now, from the client factory, we're going to create an HTTP client. And with that HTTP client, we're going to call the send async method and pass it the message. The message contains everything that you need for the request to be made. This returns a response object. From the response object, we can get the content and read it as a string into result. If it's successful, we want to redirect to the index page. Let us try this and see if it's going to work. So I'm going to go back here, refresh, and then let's add something. Let's say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O. So let us create and it worked. You can see that this is the information I entered, some dummy data. Let's next work on details. Now, if you hover over these, you will see that each one of these passes the ID of the object. So my details action method should expect the ID as a string. So let's go to our students controller and add another action method for details. And that would look something like this. The ID is being passed here as an argument and it's of type string. If the ID is null, then of course we'll return a not found. Here we instantiate the same object we did before, the HTTP request message object. We'll set the method to get. The request URI is the same as before, but we're going to tag along the ID. We're going to set the content type to be application JSON. Here we'll create an HTTP client object, call the send async method, pass it the message, and it returns a response. If the request is successful, then the response will come back as true for the is success status code. At this point, we know that the data has been read properly, so we can read the data from the stream and then deserialize the string into a student object. And here we can return the student to the view. This means that there is a details view that is missing. So we need to create that details view. Back in our views students folder, let's create a new file called details.cshtml and the markup for that will look something like this. We expect a student object that represents our model and we have a definition list here. The topic is going to be the name of the column and the detail is going to be the content. So here it's going to basically display not student ID, but ID, because that's what we set it to be the display. If you remember when we set the student model class, and then it's going to display the first name and the actual first name, the last name title, and then the content, the school title, and the school. So this is pretty much what it's going to do. And there are two buttons here. One will take you to the edit and the other one will take you back to the list. Let us try this out and chances are it won't work because we discovered that for some reason, when you have a view, the .NET watch does not quite work, but let us try. So here we are, let us refresh. And now if I click on details, it crashes again. It looks like I have to restart this and hopefully it will work. Let me come here and go back to this and click on details and that seems to work. Now we don't have edit working. So what we're going to do at this stage is just go back to the list. Of course, delete is not working yet because we didn't do the action method for that. Let's go back to our controller and add the action methods for deletion. And now there will be two action methods because we're going to implement a confirmation page for deletion. So we need to send the ID into an action method that's going to display a form. And on that form, 
the user has to confirm that they indeed want to delete this record. So there will be one action method that responds to get and another action method that responds to post. This is the action method that's going to respond to get. Here again, we expect the ID to be passed as an argument. We're going to check if it's null. If it's null, we're going to send back a not found response. Just as we did before, we're going to instantiate HTTP request message object. And again, we're going to tag API students and the actual ID because this is what the API expects. Create the HTTP client object, call the send async method, pass it the message. And this is very similar to the previous details. In fact, it is identical. The details and the delete both are the same because in the case of delete, we want to display a confirmation page. When the user confirms that they want to delete, then we need another action method that indeed carries out the delete process. And the next action method would respond to the post method. So we receive the ID as an argument and we create an HTTP request message object, set the method to delete. The URI is API students plus the ID. And this is all pretty much the same. We get a, a result in the end. And of course we could check whether the result is like we did here is success status code, but I'm not doing that here, but in reality it should be checked here. And then after we do the deletion, we can redirect back to the index page. We need to add a delete view. So let's come to students, new file, and create a file called delete.cshtml. And the markup for deletion is very similar to what we did for details, except that at the bottom here, we have a form that has a submit button and when the submit button is clicked, it will post to the delete action method. And of course, here the student ID is a hidden field. So let us try and see if this works. I'm going to stop the server and restart it again. And then we can go to our page, add a new record, create, and let's delete this. And here, this is the same data. We click on delete and it's gone. The last thing we need to do is handle edit functionality. And that means that we need to add two action methods. One is for displaying the form and the other is so that when the user clicks on the submit button, it goes off and it actually updates the data. So let's go into our student controller and add these two methods. So here are the two methods that we need for editing data. This one here, I have the HP get attribute here, which is really not necessary because that's the default, but this responds to the get method. It's going to get the ID and display it. So this code here is pretty much like the details and the delete. All it does is get, get the data and pass it on to the view. And this action method here responds to post. It means that when the submit button is pressed on the edit form, it sends the student object to the server. And this code here updates the data. Notice the most important thing here is this HTTP request message object. Its method type is put and put is associated with updating. And the rest is pretty much the same. Now, what we're missing now is the edit view. So let's come over to view students and add a new file here for edit. And it will be called edit.cshtml. And the markup for edit is going to contain a form. And when you submit this form, it goes to the edit action method. Now here, there's an input field that is hidden and it contains the student ID. Why is it hidden? 
because we don't want them to change the primary key. Everything else is visible, but the primary key, which is student ID, is hidden. We made it hidden so that it gets submitted to the server together with all the other items of data. These items of data, first name, last name, school, are allowed to be changed and updated by the user. When the user submits this form, it gets posted to the edit action method. So let us try and see if this works. So I'll stop the server again and restart it and see what happens. Okay, let's go now to the form. Let's go to the main list and let me add a new student. Let me call this A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, H. Let's create. So we created something. Let's edit it. So let me say the first name is Bob and the last name is Smith. And the school is history. Save. And there you go. Bob Smith history. Of course, the ID, we couldn't change that because it's a primary key. We don't allow it to be changed. Let's look at details. And here we are. We have all the details. If we click on edit, it takes us back to the edit screen. Let me change the name to Jane and save. And the new name is Jane. So let's go delete. And I can delete Jane and she's gone. Thank you so much for coming so far in my video and I hope to see you in future videos. Goodbye.